welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Sam Goddard. Welcome, Sam. Um, And you are Born Free's campaigns officer. So do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what that role entails? So I work in the captivity and welfare team. Um, And since I've started, I've mainly focused on the topic of dolphin captivity, um, which was great for me because that was the very topic I wanted to to work on when I joined the organisation. And what I've mainly worked on since I've been here is um, a variety of things, I guess, um, getting more NGOs coordinated on the topic. Um, So since I've worked here, we've formed DFE, Dolphin Area Free Europe Coalition, and that's all about trying to put the focus on the issue in Europe and try and make some traction in the European Parliament. Um, And just doing some you know, general public awareness campaigns such as Tank Free, which sends the the general messages of why dolphin captivity is bad and trying to think of creative ways to to send that that message. Um, We even worked on a a documentary called Inside the Tanks, which um, visited marine land in France with a documentary maker, Johnny Mia. Um, And that's got about three million hits on YouTube now. So if anyone hasn't seen that, I suggest having a watch of that. No, I haven't. I feel, yeah, Well, that was a really good documentary because he managed to get really well both sides so um he had the born free interview and um orca scientist ingrid visser dr ingrid oh, visser yeah. um but also the um i forget um the man's name but the the manager the director of marine land gave an interview um so it was a very um very t- telling interview the man was uh, being you know quite truthful um and, and of course, you know, just trying to make sure we cover all bases aside from informing the public, such as other stakeholders, especially the, the tour operators, right? Loads of NGOs are yeah. doing that now. Um, and we recently got a really good result with our partnership with British Airways because they're really looking to step up at a level beyond the, what we even expected. Um, so they've banned the sale of tickets to SeaWorld, but also all captive cetacean facilities so um, they're really looking to us to help improve their policies yeah that's amazing and actually we've seen quite a few especially in recent years we've seen quite a few big names like the ones that you've mentioned um kind of take action um against uh captive marine mammals and captivity um do you think you've seen the same like the same kind of reverse trend in um uh the public in the public well, actually, that's a really good question because I think we've achieved so much, actually, more so much with the tour operators that it'd be good to keep putting that focus back on the public because, of course, there's always going to be the corp uh, that there's already a group of people that get it that just get the issue. But these these facilities are actually still really popular. That's what I find. There's still bizarre. a lot of people going, um, including a lot of you know British tourists because they have to. They have to go abroad to see these things because we don't have any in in the UK. We haven't for nearly thirty years. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it is. You do sometimes think to yourself, why are people still still going? Um, and I don't like to go around and say to people what what to do or what to think. I do have friends ask me, and I wait until they ask me because I don't like I say like telling people. I mean, these are amazing animals, and it's um, it's no sin for people to have yeah, in their mind they want to see some yeah, they d- to, to want to see um, that animal. But I think it's about just um, introducing people to the issue because I think when I've been in it as long as I have, you sometimes forget. Things, you know, like um, when I first had this conversation um, with my partner, he said to me, I didn't realise that outside of showtime, these animals are actually kept in even smaller tanks. I didn't know that, I have to say. Um, You know, so, yeah, it is um, interesting getting those different perspectives and just keep reinforcing those truths to people that they just may not be aware of yet. Yeah. And where are we talking then? So, obviously, you've mentioned Europe. There are quite a few places in Europe, marine land in France, um, and there aren't any cetaceans in captivity in the UK, so... By cetaceans, we mean whales, dolphins, and poor voices. That's it. That's it yeah. um, so, so where are where are the kind of hot spots? I mean, are these places are new places cropping up in Europe? Um, where else, like the Americas, I guess, Sea World. Yeah. So the hot spots are still the Americas, mm-hmm. uh, Mexico oh, as really? well is, yeah. is is a hot spot. But the there's an emerging, a completely new emerging market of China. Um, they're having new facilities propping up all the time. We're seeing announcements made of new planning permissions all the time, new developments, new openings. Um, and they're sourcing their animals from Russia, wild-caught animals Wild, yeah. 
from from Russian waters. Um, so that is a massive up, upcoming yeah. problem. Um, I mean, just recently, um, it was um, in our in our network that Marine Land were thinking of. Um, transferring their animals to China because oh and then it's a flip side isn't it because they're doing that because they want to phase out dolphin yeah, and orca captivity see, in their see, own yeah. country um, but we would never want them going somewhere where they've known and been born in captive bred all their lives to be sent to somewhere where it's very known where there's no animal welfare mm -hmm. laws and the standards are so of a level where it's so likely that they're going to be suffering I've heard of those, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard of those uh, kind of like traveling facilities, like almost like circuses, I guess, for cetaceans. Is that happening in China? Or is that especially, somewhere, you know, those um, sort of Thailand yeah, like, kind oh, of area. That's like Philippines. And that's very I much the, for, that. based on dolphins, very focused on yep. dolphins. And, and yeah, taking them around um, and, you know, still making them jump through hoops of fire and then almost keeping them in a in a human pool and then transporting the dolphin and that pool to the next place. Um yeah, so, so there are lots of other happening. species beyond because I guess the flagship is orca, right? It's you know, Tilicum, Lolita, Shamu. Um, yeah, you know those are the ones that we really think of. But there are hundreds and thousands of other um, species in captivity. What kind of species are we talking about? Bottlenose, I'm assuming. Yeah, so the focus is all on orca, like you said, and I think that's because we know the numbers. There's sixty. And we know the names. You know, their stories stay in our minds so much, so much more. We can mm -hmm. put a name to the animal. Whereas there's around 3,000 captive dolphins around the world. Um, and there's belugas, um, pilot whales. So oh, there, yeah. are, there are other animals. But like you said, the focus seems to be on orca and sea world in particular, mm -hmm. despite the fact there's other facilities keeping orca. It all seems to be on sea world. And I think... That is because of Blackfish, the documentary, and 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 Tilikum. Tilikum was the was the flag, flagship animal, um, and when he killed trainer Dawn Brancho, um, it resulted in many trainers speaking out via the documentary, and that's why we do have the Blackfish effect. That documentary just blew open the the issue completely, um, and it's seen good results for the orca. You know, SeaWorld have stopped breeding their orcas. So the 20 that SeaWorld have across their three parks will be the last they ever have. But we haven't seen the same for their their belugas, their nearly 100 dolphins. They haven't stopped breeding them. No, that's so true. That, and that's something that I guess people don't really think about is that it's, I guess it's this kind of threat to human life has instigated this kind of huge urgency. And that's so true about um, the names that you hear of dolphins because it's so ironic because dolphins are probably one of the most popular species out there. I mean, mm. uh, people loved, I love dolphins growing up. I guess you did as well. Well, they're well. meant to be the most loved animal that we apparently love the most, right? But they're treated, you know, um, our love for them has meant that we want kept them in boxes yeah we want them near us we want them out of their wild home and we want them in a tank so we can see them and I think um that's very true about you know the individuals if we could have more individual stories I mean there's a dolphin living in a facility in France called Femke mm. um she was taken from the wild and I think she's been in captivity at least 40 years before she had her first and only calf that was separated from her when it was five years old um and the behaviour she's shown since, so withdrawn, doesn't even perform in shows anymore. Imagine what that must be like to be in a group of animals where they've never been your family, they're just strangers, mm. and then you finally have a child, a son within that group, and he's taken from you. Yeah, um, it just must thinking. be horrific. And as soon as there you go, there's a story. As soon as there's a story of an individual it seems the message can... Um, People start to really... Yeah. I guess it kind of resonates with them more rather yeah. than rather than it being, you know, animals that they just go see a show, come back out. You're right. It's that kind of creating a story behind an animal that really creates kind of movement. Exactly. Um, so what are... So obviously you touched on those kind of stereotypy behaviours. What, what are the other behaviours or physiological impacts of keeping? Because I think that's really important, you know, because those are the kind of things that you don't... Even though you might think, oh, you know, a dolphin travels hundreds of... Or, you know, hundreds of miles a day that's one thing to say it but what are the actual the actual impacts that you this see the thing so when we campaign for and we say these are the reasons these animals shouldn't be in tanks people think a lot of those things for orca but all those things apply to all those other species as well including dolphins so firstly they're in such tiny environments and it, i don't even see the point in going over the size because visually you can see it's a tank 
even these outdoor ones in in bays i think people think talking like the size of our office right i mean or like or smaller I smaller know, really oh god you um, know and there's these outdoor like facilities that are they keep the um dolphins yes in in sea water in a pen um but they they're captive animals they they don't have the choice to swim away they are there for the same exploitation there to be gathered around however many times a day to swim with members of the public um so there is that you know absence of choice they're they're imprisoned um and a large part of it are the social groupings like i said a lot of the time they're not related they are separated to prevent inbreeding so it's these artificial groups where animals are still fighting for dominance there's frustrations as well of their captive lives and there's a lot of um aggression and, and bullying which would would happen in in the wild but you can imagine as soon as you're if you're you if you happen away. to be that animal that poor animal you would swim away quite pronto and, and you get those um i've seen those are they called do they call them rake marks yes so that's the, t- the teeth because obviously dolphins that's have like being... proper teeth don't they yes so they base what what is that that's that's the, the, the raking off of the dominant animal's teeth along along the animal's body of which it's attacking um, and some individuals where they're very um, low in the in the social chain should we say in certain facilities are covered um, which in the wild those those animals would be able to swim away so and also when you look look in these tanks there's never anything besides water yeah this is so um, interesting so but, we were talking about this weren't we before before we got on is that I guess that's one of the key things as to why, or we thought, you know, you you said maybe you thought it was, was one of the key reasons that the kind of empathy that we feel for other other animals isn't translated is because we can't see, you know, there's just nothing in a pond. There's nothing Mm. in a pool besides water. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like if you're in a a zoo, for example, and you're looking at a a land mammal, you think, well, I'm, I'm standing on land. That animal is also on land even though obviously someone at, at Born Free would still um, question that no, and qu- question zoos in general. But when you see a dolphin, you think that animal is, is from the ocean. They've tried to recreate the ocean in that tank, but all it's got is water, mo- most often not seawater at all, heavily chlorinated. Um, yeah, li- living yeah, in a completely barren environment. So it's almost like these animals are existing day to day to to exist on display and to be fed and to maybe be forced to swim with some people, that existence. And that's why we see the behaviours in them that we see, the the depression, the the, the logging, which is just the lifeless floating. Mm-hmm. Some animals known to bang their heads against the wall, circling the tank, because they know they must know that they're, they're just there they're, they're there no, to exist. Yeah. They know that that they've been in, imprisoned. I think. And and I guess they've got absolutely no stimulation. So whereas, you know, on land in a cage you would give maybe uh you'd give um trees to a monkey let's say so he can swing around and he has something to do there's just nothing to do for cetaceans they're not granted the same kind of respect i yeah. guess so you'd like to think that a zoo I mean, would, that's would respect, offer something, yeah. something like that but yeah i feel like they're given no no stimulus and you know they might have the the shows and the um the interactions but that that it's just rep- repeated behavior that they're asked to do you could, I don't know how exhausted that they are. They could be exhausted from performing those behaviours that, that frequently. And again, there's no choice. And they often know they have to do it to get food. And the trainers say they feed them regardless. They may, that, that may, may happen. But I think the animals know to get that additional food that's going to in some way satisfy them because they're normally kept quite hungry it, yeah. a lot of the time. Um, but they're going to have to go through this this behaviour. Well, they've got no choice in the matter. So how do we go about trying to, I mean, this is quite a big question, but I mean, how do we try and go about um, replicating this um, blackfish effect for other cetaceans. For well, boobers. I think that's what Born Free wants to try and do now. We'd love to try and send that message as of 2020 and, and beyond. Um, and, and basically just say to the public, say to governments, we want to see a strategic and humane phase out of all cetaceans, not just all cut, especially dolphins. Um, but obviously it's going to be really hard because of the numbers of them. And yeah, each, each country is going to have... Exactly. Each country is going to have a different st- strategy that you that you'd need because it might have different laws, different amount of facilities. So you'd have to sort of make a plan depending on which place you're campaigning for. Um, so I guess it's making a start somewhere. Um, we're currently talking to a few countries who are asking for our help to focus on, for example, Turkey and Bulgaria are two places that are coming to mind. Um, Turkey has got ten dolphin area, so that would need to be. 
I, I guess really realistically a phase out because you couldn't overnight close no, 10, of course not. 10 facilities but of course there's the worry that if you close them are they going to get sent to other places are the facilities going to step up and take care of those animals for the remainder of their lives um, and and you know there's work needed in Bulgaria for example where I don't know if people know but there's the only dolphin area in Europe going around licensed as a, as a circus getting away with that so it's escaping the same level of um, inspection and welfare guidelines that it should be having um, and it was the same same facility that appeared in the news um, last year because um, it had the headline five dolphin deaths in, in five years and one of those was a calf that had died in front of people at the show um, so the, these are animals that are living in an indoor facility in the height of summer doing four shows a day and where I believe the riders are still uh, trainers are still riding on, on oh those God, animals yeah. so um, like I said there'd be different things to do in different no Bulgaria would be you know, saying to that uh, Prime Minister of, of Bulgaria that should no longer be licensed as a circus. Why is that? Why is that allowed to happen? And for Turkey, it would be a different plan. Yeah, of um, course. But the, and for the public, it would, all, it would be the, the same message of the, these animals. Please don't don't forget them. They're, they're cetaceans just like um, orcas and they're, they're, they've got the same suffering. And I guess all the while you're then trying to sort of limit the or trying to find a way of um, balancing that with the increase in demand in places like China. You yes, know, and, yes, that is Thailand, an entire you know, that's thing like a whole other of, it, of, of itself. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I feel I feel like that does need to be campaigned on and, and and monitored. But for them, it's it's quite new, and I don't know if we'll see any changes yet. I mean, there's still so many changes to be made in in Europe, for example, um, in our in our you know with our neighbours. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like I say, for 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 China, it's all very new for them. And I think for them to hear any message that it's wrong, they've only just. Um, you know, got got on that bandwagon. So I think for them, it's something that they want to, they're definitely going to want that to play out a little longer. I mean, they're even, they're still investing money in building new facilities. So to say, to close those facilities. Yeah, before they've even, before they've even been running, built. Yeah. But it's a massive, it's, yeah, it's a big issue. Yeah, it's a mammoth task. Um, and I think that when we talk about, you know, trying to generate this, the sense of urgency that we have with orcas, um, and we talk about the the dangers um, to people. Um, I know that before, uh, before Christmas, uh, there was an incident in Mexico with captive dolphins and a little girl and she was awfully hurt but she she's thankfully okay um but i know that w could you just tell us a little bit about yeah, that situation so we were talking about that before me. weren't we yeah. um you know ever since tilikum killed dawn brancho the trainers no longer get in the water with captive orca but with dolphins not only do they members of the public are still doing so as well and we said um the incident didn't we at the end of last year um a british mother and her daughter out in mexico in a swim with um and they ended up um in the papers because the mother's account was that the, a couple of the dolphins were trying to drag her daughter under and weren't letting go. And she was thinking, are they ever going to let her go? Am Which I ever going to get her back? Like horrific. Which is, yeah, completely horrific. And luckily, um, she didn't sustain, I believe, to, uh, too harsh of injuries. But it just makes you realise these animals, dolphins, are very strong. They're dangerous. Um, but in stories like that of people coming forward about the, 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 the truth of how easy you can get hurt in these swimwears don't come forward too often because at the time they might have to sign something um, before getting in the water that might even have wording such as, you know, you, you could be at risk of injury or even death if you swim with these animals, but people sign it, you know, they think, oh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe these sorts of things are common in activities like this. Um, but yeah, the, the, the danger is there and I would encourage you know, people to come forward w with those if, if possible. Yeah, because absolutely. It happens. And that's something that I had never thought about. So it's, it's a really important point. You know, if you ever have these issues, there's so much more behind it than you being unlucky. You know, mm. there's so much more and there's so much yes, more. Yes, and you probably aren't the and only one. Yeah. There's probably many more people that have come forward, but maybe even didn't want, didn't think of contact in the no. papers. Maybe they, they didn't even think of that. They didn't, they just thought, oh, maybe it happens. Um, yeah, but I think it must happen much more than we're knowing about. No, absolutely. And when I was actually reading about it, um, I read that the, the the place was it was described as like an es uh, as an ethical facility. Um, is there is there such thing as an ethical? F you as, as you an mentioned ethical that to me before, activity? and I, I I didn't even realize it was calling yeah. itself an ethical facility. Um, in our opinion, no. I, I'm just trying to guess why they might be calling themselves. Maybe it was an outdoor facility. Maybe they were allowing the animals to live in in seawater. Um, but to us, I mean, no animal being being held captive in, for the purposes of um, exploitation no, um, for, for activities like that is, is not, not ethical. No. And to let people face that danger as well.
And cetaceans aren't the only marine mammals. So I know that we were talking about um, sea lions as well. And that's still an issue in the UK, right? Yes. So this is something we've been um, looking into because, like I say, we've got no dolphins in the UK, but we still have sea lions. And we thought, well, that's... How can we how can we s- still have that? And I think that gets overlooked because they're not kept in a separate facility, say like a dolphin area. Some people might make distinction between a dolphin area and a zoo. The sea lions are in a zoo. Um, I guess as well, it's not as like glamorous. I don't know why. I've just never thought of it. Like I I can't actually think of somewhere in the UK that would have them, but I can think of places in the UK that have had dolphins or places in Europe that have dolphins. But I just like can't think of the same for, for sea lions. Yeah. Um, and but the thing is, these animals are still doing circus-like tricks and that's what we hope to send the message of this year of can you believe that it feels so <laughs> outdated yeah. i mean are we can, really can you believe about sea lions balancing balls on their noses yep yep so a couple of years ago that's when we first um started filming a few of these shows and we were seeing these recurring tricks of um yeah, but balancing balls, still jumping through hoops, um, doing handstands while balancing balls. Um, there literally was no argument. They wouldn't be able to have an argument for yeah, the so educational. Yeah, so I was going to say, so what, what, what would proponents of these kind of places say? They say that it's awareness or educational impact. I think some of them say that they're behaviours that the animal would exhibit in the wild and they're trying to demonstrate that. So, for example, if the animal was balancing a ball on its nose, they're um, trying to maybe demonstrate the skill that animal would have in the world of of balance um th- things like that i think is what um that they're, they're trying to get at but at the end of the day that's a captive animal used to put on a show and and balance in a, a ball and you know sea lions as a species are not threatened in in waters either yeah but, so it's not a conservation so, driven no Okay, no, interesting. So, um, to, it, to us, it just seemed like a completely obvious thing that many many of us, even NGOs, might, might have um, sh- overlooked and said, hey, this, this is a very clear message that we should be telling the public that sea lions are still here, they're still doing circus tricks and maybe a species that should be phased out from captivity. So are sea lions going to be one of your major campaigns then for, t- for 2020? Yes, we, we hope so, yeah. I hope to maybe visit these um, facilities again um, in, in, in the near future just to ensure that the, those same tricks are still being done um, and um, you know, really push forward a, a public awareness campaign um, you know footage that really shows these these circus like tricks that are being done um, and then yeah share, share that and um, get the public message out there no oh, that's great and um, what are your goals then for 2020 for uh, dolphins I guess phasing out and other cetacea I guess that is phasing out um, captivity in Europe well, we want to basically make the message clear that we ask for a phase out of all cetaceans mm-hmm. and we want the attention on dolphins as well as orcas and maybe some targeted campaigns in maybe some of the, the countries I alluded to earlier as well. Um, so what would a phasing out include? I know that we mentioned sanctuaries earlier. Um, so I'm picturing kind of sea pens. Are those animals then released? Do you keep them there for kind of two, three years and then they're released? Well, or? because of the... The amount of animals that we're talking, in reality, a phase out is usually going to mean the animals actually staying where they are. So like we saw with Canada last year when they announced oh, yeah. a ban, um, the animals are a lot, you know, are still where they are um, just because of the, the amount of animals. Um, but what's different is that breeding has been stopped. So no new animals, no new animals being imported those animals will be the last. And then while we wait for a sanctuary, if any are lucky enough to, to get a, a sanctuary space. Um, so if, you know, there are um, sanctuaries being worked on now for dolphins and for orca, the one um, that Bornfree is most aware of, that because we, we talk to the, the people working mm-hmm. on that mo- most frequently, is the whale sanctuary project. So that'll be um, in North America somewhere when the site is chosen. And is that for orca? That'll be for orca. Um, so... Yeah, any any orca that's lucky enough to get that space is very likely not going to be able to be released into the wild just because the amount of time that they've that they've been in captivity. I mean, most of the orca we have now in captivity were born there, um, so anyone eligible for release to the wild would have had to have been from the wild, and you would have had to have known their their capture site ideally. Um, but yeah, because the amount of time that these animals now have been in captivity, I mean, look at Corky, uh, the, the, oh, the yeah. orca that's been in there for, for the longest time. Um, I know Orca Lab are, w- would love to see her released to SeaWorld and, and cared for in, in, in a bay um, that they that they oversee, um, where her brother and sister actually still swim through the area. Um, 
you know, that would I, the plan there would be to care for her in in that side in and an see like, perhaps plan. how she engaged with those animals before any 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 decisions were made. But the the main plan would be to offer these animals lifetime care in the most natural environment possible. So why? Because I know that Born Free um, her released um i think it was tom and misha um i can't remember where they were from and they were two dolphins i want to say around 2015 correct me if i'm wrong so yeah and they released them how come that was possible so with, with tom and misha they were both taken from the wild um put into captivity i believe for around five years before born free were aware of them being kept in a pool in turkey a human pool like tiled a swimming pool yeah tiled pool that was subsiding um, so along with others, we, we rescued them, and that was in 2010. Um, built a sea pen for them in, 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 the, in, the, in the ocean, um, where they were rehabilitated for two years before release. So that sort of ticked all the boxes of when release is possible, as in they were wild caught. We knew the wild you caught, knew, yeah. the, 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 where they were from roughly, the, the capture site. And they'd been rehabilitated over that two-year period where they had to increase their strength. They had they were to be able to, to relearn again. to capture live fish and, and, and build up a certain stamina. Um, and then tagged in, in a, and, and released in, into the wild. So um, that was a situation where that, those were all the best things that could be in place. And then you release them into the wild and um, give, give them their chance again. Yeah, and I guess that is the optimum. You know, that would be the dream for all all animals in captivity but that's just you yeah know, not just just setting them up for yeah. um you know an equal hard time and, and suffering in in the wild is not what anyone's looking for we'd have to know that you know they were from the wild originally they can relearn those behaviors they've regained the stamp the stamina the behaviors needed um even ideally animals to reunite them with if if any of their pods can be um located um but yeah for most of these animals that are in captivity it's going to need to be kept where they are um you know cared, yeah, yeah. cared for mm -hmm. in, in in a sanctuary for for lifetime care well thank you very much sam i feel like we've had it's been really informative for me as well um and i just finally i just i find it really interesting that i mean these issues aren't new you know if we think about free willy right that was 93 i think um and yet we're still coming up against these issues the same things are being repeated um, how do we bridge that gap between um, our knowledge and I guess public action? I'm really glad you mentioned Free Willy because we were talking about that before, weren't we? Of, um, I mean, I've always had a thing about orca captivity. Um, when I was younger, I used to, if I ever saw a clip of SeaWorld in the news or I saw a clip of SeaWorld on, on TV and I saw the orca in a tank, there was just something in me sparked so strongly that I just didn't like that sight at all. I thought, well, that's sick, actually. Mm. <laughs> Um, and so for me, Free Willy was the film that I liked but hated to watch. That was my film in, in that way. Um, if I saw it on TV, I would think about, do I flip over or not? Because it was so emotionally draining for me mm. um, that I, I would always cry, always. Because, you know, and I, we were saying, weren't we, for me, Free Willy was Blackfish, should have been Blackfish first. Yeah. Why did it not spark the same and it, and, it, and it didn't it did in a way um you know that film was based on kiko the orca um children were writing letters from around the world saying release release that orca release that orca the orca that was used in the film mm. um and because i guess it had a name and a story and they'd seen yeah and and i just think and then between then and and blackfish things had kind of gone back to, to the way they were and it took Blackfish to, to to spark that again. And I don't know what was different. I think it was very important that the trainers had the courage to speak out. Any all Each and every person that was in that documentary did something amazing by doing that because you're right, people are actually hearing accounts from another human being, mm -hmm. what they witnessed there. I mean, human nature is we all believe, you know, if we have a recommendation from, from a friend, we believe that over some advert or piece that, that we're reading you know to hear from another human being what they witnessed i think did a was a large part of it mm. as well um so i'd love to see that happen for more facilities more people coming forward um and and just just sharing the truth really i think it will keep going as it is i think the blackfish effect can't be stopped now yeah it will continue and it's and just trying to get that coming, for dolphins yeah as so well. it, you know your take-home message is 
you know, don't go and visit these places. But if you do and you have an encounter that you, you know, was not what you expected, was not what, you know, you thought was going to happen, then report it, you know, and that can never be under, underestimated. No. Yeah. And just think if you're um, someone thinking about visiting SeaWorld, for example, and you were on TripAdvisor, it's very powerful if there's quite a few comments on there say of people's honesty, even if nothing actually happened, even if they said, um, I'm now unsure after going, or this is how I feel that I can't have, I haven't been able to stop thinking about this since I've gone. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong in sharing, you know, it's, and it's not about about to spread guilt or anything like that. It's about just, just like I say, reading what other people are thinking is a very, is a very powerful tool, I think, in helping others to, to maybe, you know, not telling people what to do or not to go, but just to think, have a think about what it's like for these animals. No, thank you so much, Sam. This has been really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media, or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke, and our producer's Philip Fortuna. See you next time.